This is NJTV. A court strips Christie of control over affordable housing. Citizens sound off about a tightened budget, reconsidering security for Dyfus workers after a shocking attack, and treatment for babies born addicted tonight on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Williams. A new chapter in a 40-year-long fight over affordable housing starts now. The state Supreme Court has called the Coalition on Affordable Housing moribund and non-functioning and wrested control of the process from the Christie administration, asserting the courts will handle it now. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. Key Democrats hailed the ruling. How, how else can they rule? Uh, we, you know, we have, a fail, we have failed policies. Republicans panned it. I was hopeful that with new justices being appointed to the Supreme Court that we may start seeing a different result. Since 1975 and the first Mount Laurel decision, New Jersey has been struggling over affordable housing. Yesterday's unanimous Supreme Court decision wrested control of the process away from COA, the State Council on Affordable Housing, and put decision-making back in the hands of trial judges. COA is 15 years late in promulgating new guidelines. Kevin Walsh of Fair Share Housing successfully argued the case. The court said enough is enough. We need to find another way forward that can't be blocked by political forces. Governor Christie and many Republicans have railed against COA and the high court over this issue. Christie's office downplayed yesterday's ruling, saying simply it was a call to action. The Mount Laurel Doctrine was meant to end exclusionary zoning in the suburbs. Assembly Housing Committee Chairman Jerry Green says it's a sad day when the court has to act because the governor and the legislature can't agree on a solution. When you talk about affordable units, you're not talking about poor people. You're talking about young people. You're talking about seniors being able to live in a house where they can afford to live in that house. I want to get away from low income. I want to get away from making people feel we are forcing poor people into their neighborhoods. In 1983, in Mount Laurel II, the court started allowing a developer to sue a non-compliant town for the right to build four market rate homes for every affordable unit he provided. Republicans like Scott Romanis say that has only encouraged sprawl and not helped many people. What it has been is a boon to every developer high-density developer in New Jersey. They get to build thousands and thousands of units that are sold at market rate prices. And then there's a fraction for lower moderate income housing needs. It's the fight that never ends. Housing advocates, builders, towns, and state officials wrangling over where and how to create affordable housing. Once again, the Supreme Court has found it necessary to step in, try to jumpstart the process, and challenge the other two branches of government to unsnarl the knot. In Wayne, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Joining us now is the former commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, Lori Griffa. Thanks for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. When you were commissioner in 2010, Governor Christie said the state should, quote, get the heck um, out of the business of telling people how many units they're supposed to have, and he tried to disband COA. Did you agree with that sentiment at the time, and do you agree with it now? Well, in 2010, most of the governor's focus was actually trying to work through a piece of legislation that was introduced before he was even inaugurated. I think what you're referring to is some of the statements he might have said when he was campaigning. Certainly, the governor had no love for COA, but frankly, neither did anybody else. 
Uh, but most of 2010 was really dedicated to trying to work with the legislature to fix this very broken program. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, and then there were some efforts in 2011 to use an administrative opportunity to disband COA, which the court ultimately struck down, in part leading us to where we are today with the Supreme Court ruling yesterday. What do you make of the ruling? I'm not really that surprised, to be honest. I mean, uh, these rules have been under attack for almost 10 years. Uh, these rules were initially proposed by the McGreevy administration, and I don't, I've lost count of how many battles have been fought in the court. Uh, the state has lost almost all of them, uh, and that, of course, predates Governor Christie. And uh, now we are in a position where the court has stripped uh, the state of responsibility of enforcing the Fair Housing Act and placed it solidly within the courts. You've been quoted as saying you thought this decision was very measured and apolitical. When an administrative body is not functioning, people need to have an outlet, and that outlet will be the court. What do you mean by that? Well, the the law was passed more than 25 years ago, which essentially created an alternative to going to court. You know, back in the 80s, after the Mount Laurel rulings first came out, uh, many parties, uh, towns, builders, and advocates were in the courthouse, and there was quite a logjam. It was expensive, it was uncertain, and uh, it was really not working. Co was supposed to be the solution to all of that. Unfortunately, over time, it became as bureaucratic, if not more bureaucratic, than the courts had been. And in the end, it ended up failing all of the people it was supposed to serve. Do you think that we're going to see more court fights in the future as a consequence of this ruling? Well, the, the court's decision yesterday has essentially set this up so that the parties will have to return to the courthouse to have at least a review of what the towns have been doing in the last few years. Whether or not uh, the courts will grant relief uh, to any party, and those parties might be the towns, they might be fair housing advocates, they could be builders or developers who own, who own property and are seeking to create affordable housing opportunities, whether or not those are going to result in disputes uh, and, and court fights, I don't know, but there will certainly be a lot of judicial activity come this summer. Must there be statewide oversight of affordable housing? I mean, there's a possibility that COA could regain control again. Would you be in support of that? Well, I, I would be in support of a system that worked. I mean, quite frankly, when I became the commissioner uh, and I took over COA, it was my fervent hope that we could make the system better. You know, I would, uh, I would re ask you to reflect back to 2009 uh, when there was a very heated court battle. There were something like 22 or 24 parties suing the state of New Jersey for all of the flaws of COA. When everybody's against the state, the state must be doing something wrong, don't you think? Lori Griffith, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Smoking can be hazardous to your school budget. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Edison, where a new school will rise from the ruins of James Monroe Elementary. The school was incinerated by a custodian who tossed his lit cigarette in a trash can. It'll cost $28 million to rebuild. Insurance will pay only a third. The town's fighting for more, but in the meantime, Voters have approved an $18.6 million bond to pay for construction. The cost to each taxpayer, $21 a year, the equivalent of, say, two packs of cigarettes every year for 30 years. The custodian has been retired. Next to Hamilton, where the 14th District Legislative Offices of Assemblyman Wayne D'Angelo are awash in prom dresses. It's the fourth annual Princess Prom Project he's organized. Gently worn prom gowns, formal and cocktail dresses can be donated, then passed on to girls preparing for their high school proms or sweet 16s or quinceanera. More than 200 dresses are already stockpiled. A Heightstown nonprofit called Rise Community Services goes to the trouble of picking up and distributing the dresses each year. Why? A Rise case manager says, you never want to grow up and say, I couldn't go to the prom. Finally, Tom's River, where an ex-con who just completed a 15-year sentence for robbing a stride right store came home and did it again. Prosecutors say 41-year-old Christopher Miller admitted being set free and making a beeline for stride right where, what are the odds, the same clerk he robbed in 1999 was behind the register. Miller, police say, made off with $389 and fled on foot with the employee's cell phones. This time, he could serve up to 20 years.
And that's our Garden State Express for Wednesday, March 11th, 2015. Something up in your town? Tip us off. Budget cuts can save taxpayers money. They can also risk people's lives. Take the case of Leah Coleman, a Division of Youth and Family Services employee savagely attacked at work days after police protecting her were pulled off the job to save money. Brenda Flanagan reports. We tussled, I yelled for help. Um, nobody came, a lot of people just stood there and watched. Caseworker Leah Coleman speaks softly, remembering the day last November when a client walked off the elevator at state offices in Camden, pulled out a knife, and stabbed her 21 times. She turned around and she said, oh, hi, it's you. And just stabbed me. Bam, that's it? Just like that. No warning, no argument? No argument, no warning, nothing. Coleman says it happened after the Department of Children and Families reassigned police who had often worked out of child protection and permanency services, formerly called DIFAS, at offices on Haddon Avenue. I don't know that she was aware that the police officers left that Friday and that Monday was the first day they weren't there, but it would have been a quick response. It was a mother who was, you know, clearly unstable and she was able to walk into a building with a knife, no security no metal detectors, and no police. Union Chief Sean Ludwig says after police arrested Coleman's assailant, who this week pleaded guilty to attempted murder, the state posted two security officers with metal detecting wands in the Camden office. They keep finding weapons. Knives, uh, pocket knives, uh, box cutters, and stuff like that. We're concerned for the safety of our members. This isn't you know, one, a one-time incident. This can happen all the time. I mean, it's really a scary job. I don't have a bulletproof vest. I have nothing but my ID saying I'm here to do a job and to ensure that the children are safe. Many DIFA staffers who deal with volatile clients claim they need better protection, that the state cut back on special police units to save money. They support proposed legislation called Leah's Law. There must be law enforcement in DIFA's offices. that there must be police available when workers are threatened, that there must be panic buttons available. Today, hundreds of union members rallied in Trenton where five of Leah's co-workers received awards for helping to save her life. Check yourself and how you're treating your workers because it's mad. The department did not respond to several requests for comment. Coleman hasn't spoken to Governor Christie. I feel he's heartless. Um, he hasn't even said get well. Every day, Leah Coleman battles back, trying to regain her independence. Leah's law is scheduled to be introduced tomorrow. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Funding for the Business Report is provided by the New Jersey Conference on Tourism, coming to the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City, March 12th and 13th. Registration and sponsorship information online at njtia.org. New Jersey added 3,400 new jobs last month, up from 2,400 the month before. The Roseland payroll firm ADP reports most are in the service sector, but jobs in natural resources, transportation, construction, trade, and utilities grew as well. What's also grown is the state budget to nearly $34 billion. Today, lawmakers on the Assembly Budget Committee got an earful from citizens trying to influence the way state dollars get doled out. Michael Hill reports. In Spanish and in English, they came advocating for a cost or asking for funding. 
boldly in some cases. Minimum of $10 million a year. Why? Because Preservation New Jersey says history generates revenue. Others sought money for charter schools. Some say save a program for the elderly. We ask you maintain level funding for this essential program for our most vulnerable members of our communities. Some, including mothers of addicts and still recovering addicts, said addiction treatment needs better funding. People are worth being helped and treated, and when they are, you know, they become productive members of society. You know, I'm married now, I own a house a mile from here. The comments that sparked the most conversation about the governor's plan to spend nearly $34 billion next fiscal year came from the New Jersey working family's Deborah Cornovaca, who said if you want to close the pension and other big budget gaps, stop giving away money. New Jersey now owns the record for the history of the nation of any state for giving away the more, most corporate tax subsidies, especially large dollar amounts over the past five years. As far as the effectiveness goes, we don't really know, do we? There's no way to go back and do a do-over and say, well, you haven't given these tax breaks. It could be that, that maybe our unemployment rate would still be stuck at 7%. And unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because we in the legislature have been as guilty as the executive in not attaching to each one of these programs what exactly the expectation would be. Cornovaca says the tax breaks amount to $5 billion and requested a moratorium on such generosity and that lawmakers forced the state treasury and the Economic Development Authority to reveal this giving of credits, subsidies, and grants. We keep doing the same thing over and over again, and yet we expect some kind of different result. In the call for transparency, Cornovaca found plenty of support. Republican Jay Weber of Persephone. You're exactly right in calling for additional transparency and accountability in these programs. Um, I haven't been able to get satisfactory answers from the Economic Development Authority on what they require companies to show that they're about to leave the state before they throw millions of dollars in tax credits at them. Democrat Troy Singleton of Burlington County says Weber voted against his bill to make EDA and other state spending transparent. So I was excited to hear Jay Weber give a commercial for my bill. We're hearing in the loudest and strongest possible terms that something is woefully amiss. Chairman of the Assembly Budget Committee says this is not about citizens just blowing off steam about state spending, but it is about lawmakers listening to what those citizens have to say and those citizens making an impact. And he cited one example from last year. As a result of discussions, uh, we added uh, quite a bit of money, uh, $12.5 million, two nursing homes. New Jerseyans will have another opportunity to influence state spending next Wednesday at Passaic County Community College in Patterson. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Bacterial meningitis is hard to, uh, is very rare, it's hard to contract, and it's tough to treat. Now it's believed to have claimed the life of a Newark first grader and has triggered a community-wide effort to make sure other children are not also at risk. David Cruz reports. Officials were anxious to quell any concerns among parents at the Oliver Street School after a six-year-old first grader died of a suspected case of bacterial meningitis here last week. City officials said the child was in contact with other students while she was ill, but the mayor today said there was no cause for alarm. We believe that the school is safe at this time. Uh, I know that there's anxieties about uh, surfaces in the school and all these things, but the disease can't be contracted that way. Uh, but we're going to clean up the school anyway. Uh, just to assuage the anguish and anxiety of the, the families and community members in this area. Early symptoms of meningitis include the sudden onset of a fever, headache, and stiff neck. If left untreated, it can lead to seizures, coma, and even death. The cause for concern is genuine, say experts, but outbreaks are rare since the disease is not easily transmitted. The CDC says bacterial meningitis is spread by direct contact with saliva or mucus which can happen with young children in a cafeteria or playground setting. 
what we have done at the school level is work with parents and staff to communicate exactly what's going on as far as we know here at the district. Uh, we also cleaned the school over the weekend and did a deep clean of the classroom itself. Um, at this point in time, what we do know is that meningitis is spread from fluid to fluid, um, so uh, the, the potential for uh, risk is low. Communications between the city and the school district have been strained for some time now. The mayor and superintendent, Cammie Anderson, have a relationship that can be best described as chilly. The mayor said the city is working independently of the school system to ensure that its residents are protected. We were at the school yesterday and the, the lead, leadership of the school system was, was there. The superintendent wasn't there, but you know everyone else uh, you know, was there in terms of the, the health. School officials sent notes home over the weekend and met with parents and teachers yesterday. Yesterday afternoon we had a community meeting at Oliver Street School with the Newark Health Department uh, to help answer any questions. Uh, at this point in time we are encouraging any uh, parent who have students with flu-like symptoms to go and see their health care provider. Um, and beyond that we're taking directives from the state and the, the local health department here in Newark. The mayor said he will hold another community meeting here tomorrow and told parents that transportation for families who wanted to go to a city health center would be provided. The mayor says there is no crisis here, but concerned parents should call the city's health department for more information, or barring that, see their family doctor to have their child examined. In Newark, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. The numbers of people addicted to heroin and opioid painkillers has swelled so that Governor Christie's expanded treatment programs here and increasing numbers of police are carrying the antidote Narcan to prevent addicts from overdosing. What is rarely addressed is treatment for babies who are born to addicts addicted themselves. Lauren Monco found a specialized treatment program that does just that. At PSCNG Children's Specialized Hospital, Dr. Sharon Burke examines a month and a half old infant boy. He's being treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. That was a term that has been applied to infants born to mothers who were using drugs or on prescription medications of the opioid class during the pregnancy. When an infant's umbilical cord is cut, that cuts off the flow of drugs the baby was getting from the mother. Withdrawal kicks in anywhere from 24 to 96 hours after a baby's born. Symptoms can vary from gastrointestinal issues, problems eating and breathing. Oftentimes, they're inconsolable. They may have high blood pressure. Their bodies may get very tight, rigid. Spastic is a term that we use. The clinicians use a scale to grade the degree of withdrawal the babies are going through which helps the clinician manage them with the appropriate medications. The doctors wean the babies off the drug by administering that same class of drug the mother was taking while pregnant. And take the baby through a titration process every two to three days of decreasing that drug by 10 percent. But it's done in a slow and efficient manner so that the baby does not rebound and have worsening withdrawal and or seizures. This baby boy is now completely detoxed. He's very engaging, very social. When he first came to us, all he did was cry all the time. We found that we had to give him a lot of medication to help him with his, through his withdrawal. He was given methadone for three and a half weeks. It's not just enough to treat the babies with medication. You also need to bring in the therapy components. Babies work with an entire medical team here at PSENG Children's Specialized Hospital, including feeding therapists to make sure they have the skills needed to feed safely so they don't choke. They spend a lot of time in the pool to relax their muscles and they work with occupational therapists to ensure they're alert and aware of their surroundings. Dr. Burke says the number of babies born nationwide with NAS has dramatically increased. In 2002, it was about 1.2 babies per every 1,000 live births who had neonatal abstinence syndrome. In 2009 and 2010, the most recent uh, reports are showing us that that number has jumped up to four four babies per 1,000 live births. Babies aren't born at Children's Specialized Hospital, they're referred. The staff started treating five babies a year. That's since grown to 15. I believe that underscores the true need that's out there. This little boy shouldn't need any other early intervention services. He's scheduled to go home on Friday. In New Brunswick, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News.
You might have noticed that we're broadcasting from an unfamiliar studio tonight. If you were tuned in last night, you know NJTV News had a barn burner of a production. Five fire trucks carting a battalion of New York's bravest were called when literally seconds after we began our broadcast, a studio light hanging from the overhead grid blew. In a matter of seconds, flames were lapping across the ceiling and falling on the news desk. Impressively, but not surprisingly, all the men and women of NJTV News acted quickly and calmly and kept us on the air, scarcely skipping a beat, with the cool professionalism of a Sully Sullenberger. And without our temporary studio, which is still out of commission. Our favorite tweet, NJ knows Mary Alice at NJTV has a hot show, but geesh, can she really set the news world on fire? Glad you're safe. Thank you. We're glad you're sta you stayed with us. And we hope you'll be along when we move into our new studio complex in Newark. Tomorrow in NJTV News, I'll sit down with Atlantic City Mayor Don Guardian. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Wells Fargo. Together we'll go far. And the Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with NK Architects, planning and design solutions for healthcare, education, and commerce. Camden students face a lot of challenges, but they meet them with determination and drive. Teachers like Ms. Harris make me feel like I'm part of a team, not just on a basketball court, but in a classroom. Chanel is not just a star athlete, she is a star student. I'm headed to Clemson University, where I can combine my love of sports and learning, and maybe even win a championship. I wouldn't bet against her or any of my students reaching for their dreams.